audience, welcome to Kyle and Cody's Cult Cinema Cast, home of the unwanted, the unloved, and the unappreciated. Uh, welcome to the first, un- the first remotely recorded one, which yes, we will be are fun to learn. Not in the same room right now. Do- dozens, if tens of miles away, <laughs> kilometers. Yes. Uh, I'm Kyle. I don't even think that's a. I'm Cody. Yeah. You were saying. I said, I, I was just saying, I don't even think 10 kilometers is a mile. I don't know the no, breakdown of uh, that. It's like <laughs> one point something kilometers to a mile. Okay. So maybe yeah. five? I forget exactly best. what it is. Uh, yeah, this week we're reviewing Manos, in quotes, The Hands of Fate. Yeah. A bit of a shorter movie this, this is week. A, an hour, nine minutes in total runtime yeah a little bit and shorter. it was a gr- grueling hour and tw- nine minutes yeah it's uh a lot of it that f- act one and two really drag and act three is not yeah. great either and a- half of it's a musical score or a oh, music yeah. score um, i should say musical score yeah uh, here's the here's the first like uh nine minutes of the movie people they play two entire songs over the lead characters driving in a car. Yeah, they switch songs. Any other movie that would be point the point of the movie where they put the credits in, tell you who the actors are, but nope, just playing stuff. I mean, I don't think the... A lot of it's the, really unnecessary um, exposition. I think they really harp on the fact that they're lost for like 10 minutes and... Uh, and not like an unnecessary exposition in the traditional sense just like completely unnecessary expedition that is not relevant even directly to the plot no it's just like stuff you don't need to know it's set up um, but yeah. it's not very good setup even no I'll give you a little bit of history of the movie uh directed by directed by harold warren yeah directed by harold warren on a bet from one of his uh screenplay writer buddies he did it he uh, yeah he had made a bet with a guy and said he could make a movie all on his own and he won that bet <laughs> at what cost <laughs> kyle kyle <laughs> uh twenty thousand us dollars in 1966 money uh okay <laughs> uh Fun little thing. Um, I, while I was re- researching this, they said, "Oh yeah, adjusted for inflation in 2019 money, that is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which yeah. is more than double the budget of Velocipaster." Yeah, that's this really tells you something about the nature of independent films, where like even like someone filming on their phone could make a more effect, like a more stable movie with this, like. The equipment the Manos people were using was absolute crap. It didn't record audio on site. And it could only film like 32 seconds at a time because it was hand wound. Yeah. Um, it's everything's dubbed in. They uh, were shooting a lot of the night shots under spotlights, which they only had a certain number of. So they only had a certain amount of space they could act in. Um, he gathers a bunch of uh, members of a local theater group. And then they become his his actors in this. Um, the little girl is... Uh, there's a little girl in the movie. I think she's gone from somewhere else. But uh, mm-hmm. there's her. And then there's a dog. And the, her and the dog are the only ones that in this movie that received any money for it. Oh, God. Any prop. Yeah, they were the only ones that were paid. Uh, the rest of the actors were promised shares of the profits, which don't exist. Maybe the eventual DVD sales from this eventually got them the money. But mm-hmm. I actually don't know that they're making money because this is public domain, I think. It didn't get a, any form of cult, fo- cult following till 1993 when Master Theater 3000... Mystery uh, Theater 3 Mystery Theater 1000. Yeah. Um, MST3K. That's the where this movie really picked up. And then in 2011, they uh, recovered the original film reel and used that to make the Blu-ray release. Which is what you watch if you watch this on... Uh, Prime Video, which yes. I did. I just, which looks a good bit. I got it, it off uh, YouTube, so you're welcome. Have my four dollars. 
He never made another movie, Harold Warren. He also starred in it. Yeah. Yeah, this was made famous by MS3, MST3K, who famously reviewed it on... Which I did watch that uh, sh- that uh, MST3K episode, which, um, nicely enough, is Easter-themed. Huh. Because there's chocolate bunny in it that they cut the head off. Oh, jeez. But yeah, I did watch that because I had time to kill and pretty funny it's not my cup of tea but yeah uh and and that got me i mostly watched it because i wanted to see what it looked like um with the earlier footage to see if the film was a lot more grainier and it is a fair bit more grainier i do recommend watching this on uh prime video or something because it it does look way better doesn't look good but Uh, but that's the history behind that so when you're when you're taking a movie like this do you should you compare it to something that was uh, coming out that was a little more relevant in 1968? What was coming out in 1968 that would be... Six. Yeah. Um, 1966? But, uh, I don't know. Um, I, re- I was reviewing it on like kind of the premise of like an old uh, drive-in flick, which this was. Okay. Um, yeah, this um only ran in like... It ran in like their local theater for a little bit. And uh, was shown in drive-ins around Texas and New Mexico. Okay. Originally, but... But yeah, I've been reviewing it to, like, shot on shitio movies and... Yeah, uh, home releases, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, these cheap little movies that people make. Mm-hmm. Which uh, were very prevalent. Um, This is especially bad, because, like, a lot of these dubbed movies that were kind of popular in the time uh, were, like made in italy or whatever so it's like they're dubbing it from italian which this is an american film dubbed in english that takes place in texas i know oh that's another story um one thing i found was uh when the little girl went to the premiere yeah uh, she cried because the voice coming out of her mouth wasn't hers (laughs) oh god (laughs) Oof. yeah (laughs) I mean, and she was the one that got paid for this. She got a bike. Just a bike. Yeah, they weren't paid in money. She she got a bike, and then the dog got a big bag of dog food. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't know which dog for sure. Because <laughs> yeah. there's two dogs. There is two dogs. Uh, one dies very fast. I hope it was the... Yeah. yeah. What? I, I hope it's the poodle. I like the poodle better. <laughs> well... My aunt had a poodle. R.I.P. <laughs> poodle, because I didn't catch its name. <laughs> but yeah, let's, I guess, get into the movie. Yeah. Um, I told you, we've told them a little bit about uh, what happens. It's like cheery music as they're driving. It's dubbed. You can... They're getting to an argument because they had been lost, I guess. The kids get a little upset because they're in a convertible and she's cold. And they start singing Row Your Boat to cheer them up. And it's yeah. badly sung and just... In rounds, rounds, too. Yeah. Two minutes, 30 in, they get the title card... And they're soon pulled over by a cop who's just uh, breaking the Chekhov's gun rule. Like a motherfucker. Just absolutely. He uh, is the most lenient cop I've ever seen. It's like your taillights crashed out and he's like, I'm sorry, we're running late. And the guy's like, oh, well, we'll let you off with a warning. And then he returns a couple more times in the movie. But really, he doesn't play much of a they return three times throughout the movie or three or three or four times throughout the movie but they don't show up in the finale like you were probably thinking when you were watching this yeah not at all because normally like okay here's a cop we introduce him early on so he can come out later and then uh jason Voorhees can knock him in the heck of back of the head with a hatchet or something yeah but he doesn't show up again or he doesn't show up in the finale he doesn't contribute nothing relevant i like to think of it like i like to think of it like this this cop is good at two things giving uh explanations and uh cock blocking yeah we'll get to that one so yeah um he gets talked out of a ticket yeah this this part of the movie is largely wasting time there's several parts in this where they say things over and over again Mm -hmm. um i it it brought me to the point where i had to look up the definition of a feature-length film (laughs) <laughs> because I wanted to know if they were holding to that 40, if they couldn't have made this a 40 minute movie or a 55 minute movie yeah, or a 40 minute movie, 20 minute in movie. this day and age, they, they really can't technically get away with it as a feature film at 40 minutes in this day and age. 
or in that day and age. That's when movies were starting to get uh, longer. No luck there. They couldn't. But I think there's like a 40 minute version of this movie that's not nearly as bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could cut a lot out of this. It's just wasting a lot of time, which is weird because they rented these cameras and they're just well, it's making. We it's weird because they rented the cameras and they're uh, shooting at 12 second intervals. You, you'd you think they'd be trying to expedite the uh, process of, and maybe that's why they cut uh, so weirdly is to uh, have continuity. Like maybe yeah. they'd shoot longer scenes with a lot of explanation for continuity purposes. I'm not Here's too sure. Here's the thing. There's a lot of these, uh, there's a lot of these like, shot on shittio movies that are still shot okay if the mm -hmm. camp if even if the equipment's not very good harold warren just doesn't have any skill as a filmmaker he doesn't know how to take it uh work with these constraint constraints and get around them yeah and this is he just doesn't know how to deal with this because other people must have used these cameras like he this guy was getting away with selling uh, renting them to him so there must have been a way that he could uh manage this where it would work yeah next we see the couple making out and the cops uh pull them over uh like come get them and stop them what i learned about this is that the one the actress in this was meant to be uh one of the ladies from later yeah but she is but she broke her ankle or something okay but they didn't feel like cutting her from the movie so they just put her in the car and yeah made her sit yeah yeah they're making out and drinking drinking pull, laws uh, in yeah. the 19 uh early 1960s were uh, a lot more lenient than nowadays i guess eh, drinking and really, driving but it's uh, drinking and driving yeah yeah uh yeah that was a lot more lenient they point out at they've shown this after uh the family has driven up up the road and they use this scene to say oh yeah there's nothing up there mm -hmm. just to symbolize that they're going somewhere that shouldn't be yeah this movie's just so goddamn slow in the beginning very slow like, pace we're um we're telling you what happened but this is but this is like a 20 to 30 minute process to get this far it's really dumb so yeah there's just like a pause between every line because it's dubbed and it's not very good um mm -hmm. this is the dads we're getting a little bit of characterization for them the dad's a bit of an asshole but maybe this is just the 60s and this is just how dads act yeah or maybe it's lost in between the uh in between the dub version and the like the actual script yeah i imagine that did there could have been some changes there i suppose but who's to say yeah it, and he did uh, harold warren did is on record as saying like this could this could maybe be redubbed maybe could have been redubbed as a comedy. He obviously didn't uh, go that route, but that, I think I, mean, I would have preferred I that. I mean that that's putting good money after bad. It's just like I don't think yeah. it would have gotten him anywhere. But yeah, the dad's a bit of a dick in this. Uh, and the they're the family's just really dumb in general. They don't have. Yeah. But I mean, I guess you're not exactly paying for all-star actors when you only have yeah you know x amount of budget so yeah which though he's not paying for actors so there's okay <laughs> he gets what he pays for <laughs> yeah i guess I right mean, they're just a, they are a theater group but it's community theater probably so that's not great they start turning around they show the full k turn the the or the t turn that the dad does they show every movement of this car. Yeah, this is... I think I gotta get to this, because this is... There's something to, hope about, to be said about, like, building suspense. But no, it's not building suspense. It's just doing nothing. Which is a lot of... Even some... A lot of bad horror movies make this mistake where they're just, like, building tension, but they're not. They're just doing shit for no reason. Just to make the movie longer. Or unexplained um, world building, where they're, like introducing yeah. random characters that really don't play any part in the movie in itself right so yeah. they could have been they could have been doing character building in this yes they could have they could have been yeah I, they could have been um building up that the dad loves his family and they do anything for him and that would have been thematically appropriate for the end of the movie but they're yes. not because they 
don't know anything because he's just like a lawyer or some Harold Bourne. Uh, he's actually a fertilizer salesman, according to Wikipedia. They find themselves in a building with a that just mysteriously appears after a while. They're greeted by a man with a pretty wicked hand-shaped staff. Yeah, I'll that give was this cool. Movie this. The props, yeah, the props aren't too bad in this. Mm -hmm. Like, um, none of it's too advanced or too expensive, but it is decent props. If nothing else, like, um, they got a hand prop that looks pretty good later in the movie. Um, the costumes, I guess, are okay if not yeah. used properly. They do make, like, original paintings for this. They make, like, uh, busts for shrines and whatnot. It mm -hmm. looks decent, actually. Costumes aren't too bad in this. Not like they have a lot of to do, but the, I'll give it this. It gets that little point for me, I guess. Certainly seen worse. Yeah, it's just like a uh, we find out the guy's name is Torgo. He keeps look at the uh, he keeps he keeps a look after this uh, building while the master is away. So apparently we're in a Doctor Who episode. So I mean, there's not really any danger, I guess. Uh, I don't know who's the Doctor in this era. Probably I think that's probably one of the better better. Although they're time travelers, it could just be yeah, they could just any one of them could do it. William Hartnell. Would be doing yeah. it, yeah. I've never seen an episode of Doctor Who. I'm, I've seen, like, some of it. I've been meaning to watch a couple episodes. I think if I were, were to sit down, I'd watch, like, the Matt Smith and the David Tennant, but that's, like, newer stuff, and it's been around for 40 or 50 years, so. I've wanted to watch, uh, there's one Dalek storyline that I'm really excited for that the, I think the fifth Doctor does. I don't know. We're we're avoiding the subject. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, easy to avoid the subject because uh, there's not much going on. No, and I'd like to point out this has a 1.9 rating on IMDb. I don't know how low the score goes. Yeah, 1.9 on IMDb. It's apparently got zero on Rotten Tomatoes. For oh all that Jesus! Uh, Forty percent of Google users like the film, but that's a lot of ironic likes. Yeah, the, he protects the place while the master is away. Which this really sets off how dumb the characters are. Mm -hmm. They should be turning around. It's like if you go to a place as like, "Hey, we'd like to stay." And it's like, "Oh yeah, uh, just let me ask permission from the Dark Lord of the <laughs> Sith, and uh, we'll get uh we'll just see if there's room in the torture pits." And like, "Yes, we'll go there. Stay there." And it's like this is. The worst kind of suspicious. Yeah. You drive all night to get away from these people. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, because, and they're talking about it's getting dark, it's daylight, it's like broad daylight in this scene. <laughs> it it yeah. wasn't even like late evening, like it was like mid-morning. Harold Warren was apparently hoping that uh, we just wouldn't notice. <laughs> uh, he's going from the uh, Hobbs and Shaw school of... Uh, that where you can just start things at whatever time you want and scenes can end whatever you want. It's funny, I compared a hundred million dollar movie to a twenty thousand dollar movie. And hundred and fifty thousand dollar movie. Um, oh yeah. I've never even watched a Fast and Furious movie. Oh, that is they are fun. I like uh I didn't like the one I just referenced, Hobbs and Shaw, because it's I think that th that would be the only one I would watch. The climax starts at night. Uh, mm -hmm. the middle of the day, and then the next scene is, like, broad daylight, and then they end in, like, a dark cave where things are, or, like, a dark pit where everything's raining on them. So yeah. it's, like, three different time periods throughout this, couldn't be longer than a couple hour long fight, but it's, like, so, but yeah, they're just saying, uh, he's just like, oh, jeez, we gotta stay, and he's like, yeah, stay, like, what the fuck is wrong with you, just leave. This is the most dangerous situation you could be in. This isn't like, oh, it's just them being uh, hillbillies or something like that. The guys who would stay at, like, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house did mm -hmm. not have as many red flags as these people. And on top of that, this guy's a dick to Torgo. It goes from, yeah. oh, yeah, we'll stay at your random murder house 
go get my bags from the back of the trunk. Like, Oh, yeah, he's just super <laughs> rude to this guy who's letting him stay here, presumably for free. Yeah, exactly. They never discuss payment. No. And this is an inconvenience. He's, he, uh, Torgo says that the master doesn't want them here. Mm -hmm. They change their mind eventually, but it's just like, obviously. I mean, Torgo's uh, kind of a creep, so. He doesn't put down a stick through this. No. He carries the bags holding his staff and everything. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, I wouldn't want to put that thing down anyway. I wouldn't, I, like, I'm, I'm with him on this. That's an awesome staff. Yeah. Yeah, he helps with the luggage, too, which is another thing. He's yeah. just so helpful. <laughs> and then they wake him in the night, middle of the night earlier, later in the movie. When they actually do decide to leave. It's like, oh yeah, go get the luggage for us that we're waking you up in the middle of the night. It's like, this isn't a fucking hotel. You're in this guy's house. He is doing you a favor. You're maybe p slipping him uh, a tenner in the end of the night because this is 1960 and money doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a creepy picture there of the master. Uh, he is a uh, palish man with a mustache. And like a big cloak. It's a really cool cloak in the end of the movie. Yeah, it's not a bad cloak. The props are decent in this, like we've said. Yeah, it also shows a picture of his the other dog in this movie, who's a big black dog, who's very scary looking. Probably a Doberman. Torgo kind of walks like a stop motion model. He just, uh, yeah. which I guess can be a result of an injury. I really shouldn't be making fun of this. Uh, no. But yeah, he points out that the master is dead, but that he also still knows what's going on. And this is clearly yeah. some sort of religious cult, which mm -hmm. I know this was a thing in the 60s now that I'm thinking about it. Like Jonestown or something has got to be 1960s. Or can, is yeah, this exactly. really not public knowledge? Um, Maybe this is meant to be said a little earlier, but there's no indication of that. Early Scientology probably would have been a thing too. I think it's a little early. I can't, I don't know. But yeah, they hear some, uh, toward the night, they hear some howling, or yep. not from the dog, but from outside. And it's really spooking mm -hmm. the wife, so he, uh, the husband goes to go check it out. And at that point, the as he's going to check it out, the little poodle runs out, like a little shit, and runs mm -hmm. out through the door. And gets lost, and as we find, uh, the, the dad goes to his car, gets a flashlight and a gun, which he was keeping in the damn <laughs> lockbox. Which, yeah. maybe this is... I mean, this is Texas. Yeah, it is. I just realized this is Texas. This is probably fine, what are we thinking? We're thinking with our Canadian brains, but it's not, you're not supposed to be carrying around guns in your glove box. I, just, I, I just thought of it like this. This is early 1996, or 1966. I'm also, assuming yes. everybody's packing. Well, there's no phones, yeah. right? How are you supposed to call 911? Yeah. You need to protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah, he gets the gun with a flashlight, and, or, and a flashlight. And mm -hmm. I guess this is good for this, but in this situation, so, yeah. better have it not need it. Yeah, the dog gets killed. He shoots around yeah. a bit. The bad cuts are starting to become really obvious at this point. I don't know, it's maybe the night shooting that really bugs him. And... Though earlier in the movie, there was a scene where you could see the uh, clicker. Oh. Yeah, the thing. Yeah, to signify what scene you were looking at. Okay, um, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did too, but it is there. I've seen the uh, clips of it. Yeah, we were spared the child bawling her eyes out at her dead dog, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Though God knows he already, like, ignored that broken tail light so that he couldn't, uh, he didn't have to listen to his kid whine about mm -hmm. not, uh, about not going on vacation so this is a terrible end to this day yeah um, this is not a very good wife talks about family yeah, vacation no terrible vacation the family's committed to leaving now this is the part where he was very rude to the cultist about uh not wanting to stay yeah we reveal that the master has a uh, crush on the wife and so does torgo and it's very yeah. gross uh, it's very the weird. car won't start. Yep, the car also won't start. And while uh, the dad's messing with the car, Michael, while the dad Michael is messing with the car, Torgo is like trying to uh, reach out and rub at her shoulder, uh, the wife's shoulder, and is just not 
it's a very awkward scene and like it's badly acted too like she's Mm -hmm. reacting to something that's like a lot more violent than it necessarily is displayed yeah and i think there is a sense that he thinks that uh that warren had an idea that this was going to be more violent and more Mm -hmm. racy than it is so it doesn't match up but no not at all yeah no it's it's like he tried to like he was still being like really out of line i want to be uh, clear about that but but no it's just uh and torto acted wrong Torgo seems to have some form of uh, a palsy in his hand, and he's reaching out yeah. to this woman, and she's like, no, don't do that, and I'm like, well, back up, like, half a step. <laughs> it, yeah, it's he's... taking too long. You've been doing this for too long anyways. He's clearly got some physical disabilities, maybe some medical issues, um, mm-hmm. which is maybe where the master, master pe- picked him up, but... Uh... Yeah, he's um jealous of the master because he's got so many wives and he doesn't have one. And he's yeah, like, sure six he wives. will. He wants to. Uh, yeah, he wants uh the wife as his own, but she doesn't uh, obviously want him, and obviously that's very mind controlly and rapey, very uh Jessica Jones rendition of Purple Manny. Uh, he Torgo says he will. Torgo says he will protect her, but uh, the wife eventually manages to shoo him off, slaps him, which is a very weak-sounding slap effect. All the slap effects in this movie are really badly done. Yeah. Yeah, none of them have, like, a very satisfying sound behind them. Um, Michael comes in and asks for a phone. He reveals there's no phone, and the nearest phone is 10 miles, which they'd have to walk in the middle of the night with uh, clearly mm-hmm. dangerous wild animals out. So yeah, they do end up staying the night. But uh, yeah, the master's changed his mind about them staying because he wants the wife for himself. Mm-hmm. They're arguing about yeah, the the mom and the dad are arguing, and the kid just wanders the fuck off yeah. while they're talking. You get to zoom in on them hand holding, which is maybe their attempt at uh, foreshadowing and just like him telling them symbolizing their love. Yeah, he's they. Uh, the kid eventually comes back pretty quick with uh, the master's big dog, uh, which they eventually chew away and get the kid. And the kid's okay. voice acting is very bad quality. So yeah. I want to talk about the scene here because the dad goes, oh, she's probably just playing hide and seek. Why don't we go look for her? They split up and throughout the, the scene in this uh, main room, there's been a door behind them and a door beside them. And so he goes to the front door, tries to open it, and he goes, well, it's bolted, and goes to the next door, and she tries to open it, and I don't... She didn't succeed in opening it, did she? Recall, like, I, I'm pretty sure she opens it up, uh, opens it up like a fraction of a second, and then closes it really yeah. quickly. And was like, I can't get in through this door either. And I'm like, you just opened it. That's, <laughs> yeah, I, I buy that that's an effect they're, they're trying for. And the yeah. actress opened it by accident. Because you don't mm-hmm. need to lock the door. You just need to... Yeah. But yeah, the wife is, uh, yeah, they, they talk to the kid, tell her to never run off again. Um, Torgo walks over to the shrine. He talks shit to the master's first wife, who's uh, mm-hmm. A fairly important character. She, yeah, we talk, we'll talk about her a little later. Tor- Torgo uh, is staring through the window and catches the wife taking her clothes off just to the underwear. She's I th- Warren did initially want a topless scene, but the actor actress turned him down because of course she did. You don't drop that on on people on a day of filming. You gotta pay for that shit up front. Yeah, exactly. But. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to talk about how uh, this scene actually transpired because Warren or Michael, because he acts as both in this uh, writer and he stars in it, uh, he says to his wife, go into the other room and barricade yourself in there. And she doesn't do that at all. She doesn't like put a dresser in front of the door or anything. Yeah. Um, and then... And then at this point in time, she's like, well, I'm barricading myself in this room. 
Uh, he didn't give me a gun or anything. I'm just stuck in here by myself. Yeah. And then she's like, well, time to change into my PJs, randomly. Yeah, she stays in them. Which is yeah. weird. <laughs> she never somebody puts tells on me, regular clothes, even when... Here's my kid, and here's me. Go barricade yourself in the room. My thir first process, uh, like, thought process isn't to, like, pajama party it up. It'd be like, okay, let's defend ourselves, right? Yeah, he's making his attempt at a uh, sex appeal, which he can't pay for, because this is a theater group, and not... He wasn't able to pay for nudity, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this, this is... We'll talk about this here. He... He clearly wants to make something in the line with these cult films of uh, mm -hmm. these uh, low-budget uh, drive-in films of the time, but he doesn't have any of the assets they did. He doesn't have the uh, gore effects. He doesn't have the nudity in it at all, so anything you might be going to those for, you're not really finding here. No. Because he doesn't have that. Or a good storyline. Yeah. And, and though a lot of those didn't have great storylines either, so... Um, the cultist, uh, yeah, uh, Torgo managed to knock out the, n knock out the husband. He is slowly, he is slowly dragged away and tied to a tree. He, Torgo doesn't keep the gun. He finds it, tosses no, he it doesn't. away, he doesn't keep the gun or the flashlight, uh, which he leaves on, which has a good battery life, apparently, because he picks it up, like, a half hour later. We now see the master awake, and he stares into the camera and gives his, uh, thing. We get another thing in a Couples making out, the cops again. This is all pointless. They don't do anything. The master calls upon Manos, which is the source of his power, I guess. I guess there's a bust of Manos there. Um, he instantly looks annoyed with the wives that he's awakened. So this isn't even like he's enjoying having six of these women that they aren't his, aren't totally his slaves. No. Like they have free, well, they have free will to some extent they maybe still love him but not or love quotation marks heavy quotation marks mm -hmm. they're st like they still want to keep him around but they're like oh yeah, yeah mind controlled uh, them into being like my stereotypic stereotypical sitcom wife that we're always annoyed with which is i don't know or, that's what uh, he wants. these guys are like gargoyles too they, they come out on uh only at midnight? They only awake during the night? Yeah, I guess that's the idea. I don't know what the full deal is. The women are... Uh, and, they're and they're they implied to be some sort too. of undead. Yeah, yeah, they're implied to be some form of undead. Do they come out only on full moons? I don't know. It's not stated. Because, yes. But Ward, uh, he's doing the same thing that Brandon Steer did. He shows a full moon, and I don't know if that's an indicator that it's night, or... The full moon has some form of special effects adding to the movie. Yeah. The wives are all pissed about the child and the woman being there. Particularly the child. They're arguing about whether or not to kill with, kill the child. Uh, the first wife, who we were talking about, is uh, arguing not to kill the child. And this, uh, this scene, I don't know if it has something to do with the dubs or if it has something to do with the uh, situation, like the acting situation but they they continually put over top of itself the the same lines yeah if you didn't notice them. that you can yeah constantly yeah over and over again yes yeah, it's just really unnatural they don't have people talking over each other at all which is weird and they the, the wives are arguing with the kid they break into a cat fight they're all clearly wearing Daddy. just modern underwear and whatnot it's meant to be sexy but if this was a proper x-rated drive-in movie movie they'd all be like not wearing pants or whatever it's like yeah it's some of these are models but i don't think they're i certainly don't think he's hiring uh strippers or anything for this but which would be something uh, mm. a lot of drive-in movies did i i feel like strippers would yeah ask for a pay yeah the, yeah that might be the thing actually you need to pay people up front for stuff yeah, that might be a big obstacle for him if that's what he wants. But yeah, it's just not competing with like other stuff in this sphere of filmmaking. Like it's not doing the brash, abrasive things that a lot of this drive-in culture is getting. Especially yeah. in the early um, uh, 60s when drive-ins were really popular. 
getting a lot of biker movies and whatnot. And yeah, mm-hmm. the Torgo's going a bit Starscream here. He's trying to talk to yeah he's trying to convince the master to let him have the wife he's not having him manos is it gives him a like a speech and is telling him to yeah he's he's giving him a speech and is telling him how he's doomed and everything and then we see uh the master raise his arms and we see the whole majesty of the cloak and it uh hides torgo behind it this doesn't mean anything he doesn't die for a little bit yet but I'm like my assumption is that Torgo has to follow the master's orders. It's just weirdly done. Like he's not a uh, a movie that was thinking hard about this would make uh, Torgo resist somehow, and it's just like seems like there's a couple scenes after this. They should have been before this, maybe, or maybe yeah. he should have had this uh, conversation. Oh, here's what they should have done. He should have confronted Torgo on the at the altar thing. The wives pin Torgo down on the pedestal, and then as the wives move in to kill him, he raises the cloaks, and we don't see it because he's doing a big thing. And maybe if you had the money for it, you turn the camera around and you see them uh, putting knives into him and stuff, or whatever. I don't know. As it Something is, a little more it is kind of like yeah. Which he doesn't Slap have the money for. Death. But as it is, yeah, they just kind of like massage him to death. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't. <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't really die from it. He just eventually gets burst into flames. And uh, the master mm-hmm. takes his hand in a prop that looks actually pretty good. I'd like to talk about that scene right there for a second. Because uh, maybe maybe it happened a little different between the, the two different copies of the movie. but. From my understanding, the the master took his hand and like grabbed this uh, center burning altar that they had there, and it, it exploded in like flames. Yeah, did that's that not happened yeah. in your movie. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that happened. Okay, that did. Yeah. No. So I'm I just, was just, just I guess making I was just sure. it weird. The husband is tied up, and the first wife finds him and uh, makes out with him a bit, a little bit. The husband doesn't wake up, so there's that. And then she so. starts slapping him. They've got this weird yeah. slap thing she going on. Slaps for like him to a, wake up. Still doesn't wake up. And then she runs up. off. Here's my issue with it. So when they showed uh, Michael getting knocked out, um, uh, Torgo sneaks up behind him with his uh, walking stick, but he doesn't hit him over the head or anything. Is just like a little whack to the back, and he falls down, and like he's out conscious apparently. Like. The force of the hit does not look like it would knock him out for any long periods of time. Or not enough that somebody slapping you would have uh wouldn't have revived you. It's not shot properly or he can't he couldn't get the shot he wanted, one of the two. Yeah, we cut to the what uh the mother, she is pleading for Mike to ret- This is yeah, this is the weird part. Torgo the stuff I talked about, Torgo dying, still hadn't happened yet, and it happens after this, and then the disobedient his wife gets killed, and she gives him a thing about how he's uh, losing his power and how he will be God will come for him or something like that, and it means nothing. Yeah, he die. They die to the ritual, and like you get this question of like the whether the whether they're even in danger because they're just not doing anything threatening toward them. There's no knives in this movie or anything like you'd normally expect to like hold up to people's throat or anything. Yeah, they just have the one gun in this entire movie. Which they only shoot like, I think four times, maybe six. Six in the end. Yeah. They only really go through the the revolver, the the revolver clip. yeah they only go through like one clip which is kind of good because i don't know how much budget they actually had towards props and i don't know how much props guns um cost at this day and age blanks are i'm assuming pretty expensive the gun i'm not too sure the gun doesn't look fake it looks it looks fairly real at least but yeah i don't 
they do fire off some smoke, so it's who's to say what the deal is there for sure. I'm not an expert on this stuff. Yeah, um, Mike gets out on his own. He just struggles out pretty quickly. He doesn't have to, like, cut the ropes or anything. And, yeah, he picks up the gun and the flashlight that Torgo and the first wife just left behind. Oh, so that's a whole yeah, continuity it's really... here. Oh, but yeah, it's okay, really I just... see what you're saying now, like... Yeah, the they knock the gun... Yeah, Torgo knocks the gun out of his hands and then doesn't take it away. He just leaves it there. Which is really dumb. Like well, even well, if the you first had wife's to... on the altar right now, right? Yeah. Okay, so maybe this it was is a, the, the... Yeah. she doesn't let him. She doesn't let the husband out. He gets out on his own. Okay, so, that so was the point. newest wife. I, I think we 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 are messing up the wives here. Actually, so the fir when you say the first wife, that's the blonde lady. Ta uh, attached yeah. to it, or is that the last wife? No, so that's the first wife they mention. Uh, Cause, Torgo cause there's mentions one on that... the altar, and she's blonde, and then the black-haired one is the one that was making out with the uh, with uh, Michael. Was it her? Yeah, I think so. Up. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to yeah. remember. This is hard to keep track of, but uh, yeah, the first wife is the one that's kind of trying to side with them or whatever, a little bit, mm -hmm. and she's. Uh, Torgo makes a point earlier that uh, the master's getting tired of her and that he doesn't want her either, which is okay. I'd, I'd like to uh, bring uh, up the fact that uh, um, about Torgo uh, that we kind of overlooked, but like the master said to Torgo, I know what you are doing and the wives know what you're doing to them when we're asleep. So he's like, Ugh. Yeah, yeah, like really That's, creepy. Yeah, I forgot to take a note like, of that. Yeah, that is, I do remember that though. Yeah, Ugh. yeah, c like coming to the altar when they're asleep and like trying to not gonna get into the details there, but the, like, the implications are there that he's doing. He's like, uh, where are we here? The Mike's Mike's gone out of the being thing. He gets back to the house before the cult. Yeah, it's just, just, um, yeah, we finally actually get to the point where Targo gets his hand ripped off and he's dead. Mm -hmm. After that, we get, yeah, and then, the, yeah, this is the point where they're finally killing the, uh, main guys. I think Torgo actually runs off after to rip his hand off, so it's, yeah, he just runs, who knows, like, yeah, his hand's this on doesn't fire. doesn't make a lot of sense. He, he's not, like, yeah, he engulfed it in flames. Make... Yeah, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. And then he does kill the first wife after her, like, sudden conversion to Jesus. And because she's him, like, oh, yeah. yeah, God will slap you. Yeah. Just weak slaps. Um, but at least he's alternating this time. He's going, like, forehand, backhand, forehand, backhand. Like, it's a little more brutal than the, the uh, pajama slap fight they were having earlier in the movie and i think only because he is a man in possession of a larger figure i think that's all it is yeah like i think mm -hmm. just like he having a larger figure would just be more naturally inclined to give that more yeah yes yeah. i don't think it's any fault anything yeah no one's doing anything doing the actresses any favors unless the family that's now tries to run away can't. Margaret trips on stuff. Mike biffs it down the hill. Sorry, this uh, this scene actually made me really angry because like Margaret for the longest time is like just go on without me, take our daughter or none, and and he, she, she's like not even hurt her or anything. She's just like giving up. Yeah, she is kind of giving. <laughs> yeah, for clarification, she I, I... falls, breaks her ankle. Uh, apparently, I guess, breaks her ankle, and he just... She just, yeah, just starts giving up at this point, which I don't know if that would really appease him, but... I, I mean, technically, like, she's, uh... She's going for... And it, uh, she's going on vacation. She is wearing uh, high heels, which, if you're gonna be sprinting through the desert, don't wear high heels. Yeah, she's just, like, 
obviously trying to sacrifice herself and he, he's just like no come on we can we can make it and i'm like it's 10 miles through the desert to the nearest phone and you don't even know if you're running in the right direction you could just be running deeper into the desert there's wild animals a rattlesnake that you took a couple yeah yeah he takes the shot at the rattlesnake that draws the attention of uh some cops in the distance who don't go and investigate because they're out of the boonies and people just shoot guns all the time. Which, Texas, I guess. But, so. like, they're, they have a really weird way of justifying it. They're like, oh, we heard shots off in the distance. We should go investigate. And the other cop's like, hold up a second. We hear shots all the time. They can be coming from Mexico for all we know. Let's not do anything about it. Probably not doing his proper cop due diligence here. Not at all. So they head back to the house for dumb reasons. And, uh, sorry, they were out already going towards the place, the cops. They were looking for the, the vehicle because earlier on, the uh, two couples that were making out, or the couple that was making out, um pointed them towards where they were supposed to be going for to find this uh family so they are already heading out that way and in this scene they continue driving the same way they're like we're not going to go investigate and then they keep on going on in the same direction like they don't for somebody who sat there and shot a whole scene of a car turning around You'd think they'd be like, oh, the police aren't going to go. Let's show them turning around, right? Not let's show them continuing to drive in the same direction. Oh, but that would take know. them outside it's... of their single spotlight that they can show. <laughs> so <laughs> That's fair. Um, yeah, they get back. The family gets back to the house. Um, they do the f f climax of the film. Mike shoots at the master, we assume, because we mm -hmm. don't actually see the gunshots. And uh, then we cut, and we see silhouettes and another uh, couple ladies driving. They uh, take down some of the same turns that the family had come down, and they're driving up to the mysterious house. And then we see clips of the master and the wives, and then Mar the wife, Mar uh, the mother, Margaret, and then the little girl. And... Then we see, as the two ladies drive up, the, fa the uh, Michael aunt comes out and says, Hello, I'm Michael. I protect the place while the master isn't home. And that, yeah. I'll grant it this, that is a solid gut punch. Mm -hmm. Like, that is, that is just, like, devastating failure. That's... Yeah, you're the new Torgo. Almost... And not even quite the new Torgo, because it's, like, far more cruel. Torgo was clearly a bit crazy and wasn't, uh, and was mm -hmm. doing this kind of enthusiastically. He's just doing it, I presume, either to keep his family alive or to keep them from suffering some worse torment, which could be possible. So it's, it's a solid little gut punch, that. And it almost makes the... It honestly brought the entire movie up a point for me. Like, that is worth an entire point on the scale to me. Here's what I have to say. Whoever Valley Lodge is, you really need to learn how to, like, give yourself better directions because apparently people keep on falling off the face of the earth and entering into a uh, another dimension every time somebody... <laughs> I wouldn't be entirely surprised that Torgo just put up that sign. Yeah. Or the the business itself never existed, and it's a front. Yeah, possible, I suppose. I mean... Yeah, get, for, yeah. get people from out of state or whatever. But yeah, and then they uh, play the song Forgetting You, which uh, some people might have actually have heard. I recognized it from places. That's not a bad song. Nope. Like some... Yeah, I don't know. I've I've heard it places... I think just as reference, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah, it's a nice little song they play at the end. Well, it's probably better than all the other songs they've played during the movie. It is, yeah. It's the best song in the movie. But yeah, yeah, just that, that that's just a solid little gut punch that um 
the movie should have been working toward that its entire time. Mm-hmm. Like everything should have been in service to that ending, and it just doesn't quite work. Um, like they say things about like the master having like waning power that ends up being bullshit from this. Like you should have had like scenes early in the movie where the husband's just like, I would do anything for my family and whatnot. And that should have been his big characterization. It's, it's a shame. This is a decent ending on a really bad movie. It is a decent ending. And I think with that being said, that's probably what drove the whole idea that there should be sequels to this movie now that they have better technology and now that they have better I think um uh, I think they're I, I looked stuff. it up while we were on break and uh I guess the uh they're doing some uh 2020 thing starring the little girl as like uh she gets oh, out cool. at some point I guess that's a thing lying around I don't know where it is but yeah well what do you give the movie Cody I think I, I, I'd have to say I'm going to give this uh, probably my lowest score yet. I'm going to give this a 1. This was yeah barely a movie. <laughs> it's it, it's the, the picture in itself wasn't good. The like 1968 or 66 regardless of how how early the movie was set. It has a good end premise. It does not have a good build up. The picture's bad. The music's grating. Um, at one point in time, I stopped and said to myself, "Is that is somebody playing a fucking recorder <laughs> in the background?" Like one thing that I really liked is whenever Torgo seemed to walk, they had a very distinct tune going on. <laughs> and then when when Torgo mm-hmm. stopped, the music stopped, and I'm like, "So yeah." Like with that being said, uh, I don't really think this deserves much more than maybe a two at best yeah i'm i'm giving it a two purely for that ending and that's because everything else is a one that ending gets it up a point because that gives me hope that if they this uh if the bet had been that warren had to write a screenplay and this had gone put off to an actual director that this could have been something at least okay And, like, if you cut 20 minutes out of this, it's probably at least something passable. Like, maybe a four. But I don't know that this is the worst movie ever made. Because it had something clever in it. And the props were okay, so. But it is hailed really badly. What are we going to review next week, Cody? I don't have any reference to that. Where is our dice? I had my, I accidentally hit the microphone in my Google search thing because I was gonna like Google search tell it to roll a thing, and it just uh, it caught me say say the words "Do you want to play?" and it brought up uh, the entry for the book "Do you want to play with my balls?" a book by Christopher <laughs> Cifaldi and Matthew Cifaldi. It appears to be like a parody children's book. Uh, so <laughs> okay. Sorry, I have that. a lot to unpack here. Uh, yeah. First of all, just... why, is there, why, is there, why does it require two people to write a children's book? I think they're brothers. Like, is it a, I would assume. Yeah, but is it like a, a, a writer-illustrator like package deal type thing? I mean, thing, it's or is picture it... book, maybe. It's probably a picture book. Okay. It's a kid's book. Like okay. It's, it looks really skewed young, or at least pseudo-skewed yeah. young. All right. I, I, well, uh, 13. That is Breakfast Club. Nice. I was hoping for that yeah. anyways. Yeah, you've been Yeah, you've been wanting to watch this. Maybe not necessarily call re- film, but you watch it. a lot. Yeah, it's not yeah. something that a lot of people have actually watched, so I'm counting it. So mm-hmm. yeah. Breakfast Club next week. I don't really know what to expect. I do. We'll see you next week, kids. Hey kids, I'm Editor Kyle. I differ from the Kyle you just watched and that I have actually seen the Breakfast Club movie. So yeah, I hope you didn't mind the different recording situation this week. Energy's a little different, but I think we'll work on that. Um, it is the way things are going to happen for this for the foreseeable future. But so, yeah, nothing we can do about it. You can remember to follow us on uh, Twitter at KC Cinemapod and on Facebook at Kyle and Cody's Cult Classics. And remember to give us those five-star reviews in iTunes. And circulate the links if you 
feel you like the show. So yeah, Breakfast Club next week. And then after that, we I can report that we are returning to our sub-theme of the season of Razzie movies that aren't actually that bad. This one's probably going to be another controversial one. Um, though that's what you're going to expect. These are all Razzie movies. Um, we are going to do a uh, bit of a mini May the 4th special and do Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. So stay tuned for that in two weeks. So yeah, that's all I got. After that, we'll be back to random episodes again. All right, well, that's all I got to say this week. Bye, kids.